A team on a five-game win streak against an up-and-comer in the SEC. Who takes this one on Saturday? This is Locked On Baylor and the Locked On Razorbacks. You are Locked On Baylor, your daily podcast on the Baylor Bears, part of the Locked On Podcast Network, your team every day. Happy Friday, everybody. Drake Toll with you here from Locked On Baylor and Sports Illustrated's Inside the Bears for crossover edition with Locked On Razorbacks' John Neighbors, who's also with 1037 The Buzz. John, jumping right into this one. Oh, and thanking everyone out there for listening to our shows as their first listen every single day, respectively. Arkansas and Baylor on Saturday, two Southwest Conference foes and two freshman phenoms going at it. I want to start by getting a good overview of this Razorback team that, to me, is nowhere near 100%, and with Nick Smith being up in the air still, may never be. Yeah, this is a, a kind of a weird year for Arkansas, at least so far. It, it's always been a, a weird deal where they start off pretty slow in conference play. Yeah. But this year was different because the expectations were so high. And you mentioned the fact that Nick Smith, uh, who was the number one overall player at coming out of high school last year, Arkansas got him. They got Anthony Black. They got Jordan Walsh. They got three McDonald's All-Americans on the same team. And they got some big-time transfers, Trevin Brazil, Ricky Council, and returning Devo Davis. It just seemed like all the stars were aligning for it to be great. And injuries happen. And, you know, struggles have happened. And Nick Smith has really not played so much this year. He's supposed to be back in February, uh, but this game's not being taken place in February. So we're not going to see him this weekend against Baylor. But, yeah, this, this team's good. They're fine. They're a tournament team. But mm -hmm. without Nick Smith, it's really tough to say – that they could or feel confident at least that they could go and replicate an elite eight appearance like they have the past couple of years. John an Arkansas born guy, myself, Valonia native. I've been able to follow, you know, through the John Pelfrey to Mike Anderson growing up on Razorback basketball before transitioning into Baylor. And it seems like Eric Musselman has found this footing in your first few SEC games aren't going to look great, but then somewhere along the line, there's a click, a snap. And same as last year, this team just picks it up and, and makes a run in March it has the click happened? They've won two straight in SEC play. Is is Arkansas where it needs to be to make a run in conference play and, and even beat Baylor on Saturday? I say no, just because it's like they've won two in a row, which is great because they were not doing that at all. They were losing at a high clip, started one and five in conference play, but they were able to beat teams like Ole Miss and LSU, who are two of the worst teams in the conference, and they won both those games at home. So it's kind of like, yeah, you won, but do you really feel like this is some sort of thing to where you go, all right, the corner has been, you know, you're turning it and you're going to start really going wild and crazy. I'm, I'm not to that point yet. Now, if Arsenal was able to beat Baylor this weekend, okay, then you could really start saying that there's some legitimacy to it. But it's like Arkansas's schedule has been pretty brutal at the start, but they just haven't won any quality games. So I just, I'm, I'm not to that point yet. They're capable of it. And maybe it happens, but right now there's just too much else and too many other things to do before that happens. John, these two these two teams mirror each other at least a little bit in that regard. Baylor started 0-3 in a really tough Big 12. They finally picked it back up a little bit. Arkansas trying to get to the spot where Baylor is with five straight. And this game, it's not like a, the straw that breaks the camel's back by any means, but does it feel like there are a little more March implications when you're going on the road against a top 20 team and Arkansas could use this as a, a feather in the resume cap? Yeah, I think so. I think that anytime that you're able to go on the road against any top 25 team, especially, it's going to have that feel. And that's something that Arkansas desperately needs because they've yet to win a true road game this year. Uh, uh, they won in Maui. And that had an NCAA tournament feel, too, where they played Creighton and uh, they played San Diego State, so some good teams. But this is going to be the first time that they go on the road to take on a high-quality opponent. Like Because Auburn even is, is kind of good, but I don't, I'm still not sold on them. But Baylor and the way that they're playing, especially them coming off that win against Kansas, it's like you can tell that this is uh, this is going to be a high quality team that you know could make another run in March too. So that's why if you're Arkansas, you got to look at it in the perspective of yeah, it's not an SEC game, so it's not going to count against us. But when it comes to going in and getting that resume building win, this is one that, that they desperately need. They they need to make up for some of the bad losses that they had. So 
I think it's going to be a feel. I think the, I hope the atmosphere is going to be great down there in Waco. I'm going to be down there actually. So uh, it's going to be my first time ever in Waco, but mm. uh, yeah, the atmosphere I'm sure is going to be something that Razorback fans or at least Razorback players are used to, but still it, it's, there's going to be a lot of energy in that building. I'm sure. Absolutely. I think the fans of Baylor are are always fired, fired up to play Arkansas. There seems to be so many random connections between Arkansas fans, Baylor fans with the Southwest Conference and those two teams meeting for so long. And to to close up all the Arkansas questions, this one's twofold. I want to start if the Hogs are not just going to win this game, but win games in general. I mean, they held LSU to 40 points. What is it that this team does well in games that they dominate or win? Well, what they do well is it's it's weird to even say it because they have won games in so many different ways it's really tough to know what they do well because it's so inconsistent like yeah. there'll be times where they do a really good job of shooting well from the field get to the free throw line and shooting a high clip of free throws but for here's a great example arkansas against missouri on the road they lost that game but they went 21 of 23 from the free throw line and then the next game against Ole miss they go five of 19 so it's like how does that make sense? You're at home too. So you can't say, oh, well, going to the free throw line. You can't really say not turning the ball over, taking care of it because there's times they do it. There's times they're not. So it's really tough to say what they do consistently well. But I would say probably rebounding for sure. They're really good at They got some sizable guys down there and they've really improved their rebounding. And defense overall is really good. They're, they're good at the, the perimeter and holding teams to, except for the exception of Vanderbilt, which was just on fire, but they do a good job of, holding teams low to, to free three point percentages and whatnot. So uh, defense and rebounding is pretty much uh, what they're most consistent at, but they're capable of being good at really anything on any given day. Hmm. So there it is. Defense rebounding. If Baylor is going to, if Baylor's going to lose, Arkansas wins defense and rebounding. Then on the flip side, this team has taken those tough losses like that Vanderbilt game, like the Missouri game where just a ref show, which we get plenty of that in the big 12, if Arkansas loses a basketball game, what usually goes wrong? Well, free throws, as we just mentioned. Uh, Arkansas doesn't make their free throws, which problematic, or just don't shoot well in general. Arkansas is not a good shooting team at all, at all. In fact, the best shooter on the team might be Devo Davis, and he's not that great at all. Yeah. So they can't shoot. Now, they can get to the rim. They can dunk. They can get to layups, you know, they can hit free throws on occasion. They can't hit a three on occasion, but they are just not a good shooting team. So if it ends up being one of those types of games where Baylor just really does a good job defensively against Arkansas and they can't find any ways to get some shots going, it's going to be a long day for Arkansas. And that's just the way it is, which makes it so fascinating why they're playing Baylor. And, you know, Baylor's kind of been known the last time the two teams met there in the Elite Eight. Uh, they're, you know, they're very physical and, uh, obviously very well coached. So it's going to come down to if Arkansas can just make shots, they get open shots, but they just still can't make them. And I know it's obviously the most cliche thing is, Hey, if you score more than the other opponent, you win. Well, yeah, but you got to actually make the shots because they're also a young team that loses confidence pretty easily if they don't start making those shots. All right. So that's the key for Baylor. Get out ahead early and break the, I mean, you break the will and guys can't shoot. I'm sure like being a true road game is not going to help either in this one. Uh, and, and John, that kind of goes into transitions well into things that Arkansas fans would like to know about this Baylor team or Waco in general as they go into it. But first, uh, John, what is your favorite thing about fanduel.com? Well, my favorite thing about it is how easy it is to use. I'm a big app guy, obviously, on my phone. And if I have an app that is not easy and convenient to navigate, I hate it. And so for FanDuel, for that reason, it's really easy to use. Yeah, FanDuel right now, if you put in $5 in free bets, get $150 back. There is Arkansas Baylor. If you want to wager on this game, what's the whole deal with Arkansas and sports betting? Is this a thing now? Is it in limbo? What's going on right now? No, oh, yeah, sports betting is uh, is here in Arkansas. It's here in Arkansas. So, uh, yeah, it's it's a new thing that people really enjoy and really take advantage of. So, boom, FanDuel. It's right there for you. Five for $150 in free play at FanDuel.com. Go to FanDuel.com forward slash locked on. Money lines, point spreads, player props, all that more. AFC, NFC championships this weekend. Safe, secure, easy to use, like John mentioned. All of that, FanDuel.com slash locked on. The official sports book of the NFL. John, the ball is in your court. 
Yeah, because now with Arkansas facing off against Baylor, I'm going to be honest, I don't think fans are very confident going into this one. I don't think many fans are expecting to win this one, uh, especially given just how Arkansas has played and looking at how, ba uh, how Baylor has gotten it going. But you mentioned the 0-3 start mm. in conference play that Baylor had. So what was the key to turning that around? Because granted, I mean, you lose to TCU. There's no shame in that necessarily. You know, Kansas yeah. State's really good too. But to go and win five straight and the latest one be against Kansas, so what's been the key to the turnaround and getting back on track for Baylor? Yeah, the Bears are the second youngest team in the Big 12. They've dealt with some of the stuff that Arkansas has dealt with and that on nights where the shots aren't falling, they're, they're not going to fall late when the game matters most. And so all three of those losses came where you're right at the doorstep, aside from Iowa State, where you're right at the doorstep to close out a game and you just don't. So they were really frustrating for Baylor fans, especially. I know Scott Drew. And, and it's the nature of the Big 12, too, that at some point you're probably going to lose three straight. Kansas is going through that right now. Kansas State's about to hit their spell of it. Uh, and, and Baylor lives and dies by the three. They are going to die more nights than not. Uh, the Kansas game that they won, they went nine from 30 behind the arc. They spent seven minutes between the two-minute mark and the nine-minute mark in the second half without a field goal. Still won the game. Uh, there are nights where they die by the three and still win the game. They just don't shoot the ball well from outside. The the thing, the saving grace in these last five games have been offensive boards. That That is where Baylor's made its bed. Scott Drew said probably a month and a half ago that the team's got to get better at rebounding. Since then, they've only lost a rebounding battle once in their eight Big 12 games. So Arkansas strength rebounding, Baylor strength rebounding. Wherever that category lands is likely who's got the upper hand in this game. Yeah, because I saw that both teams are averaging exactly 36.3 rebounds a game, like identical numbers there. So, yeah. Uh, but when you say live and die by the three, I think that Razorback fans may be not happy about that because, you know, anytime that you can start getting hot from three, it's always problematic. Yeah. But Arkansas has overall done a pretty good job at guarding the three. So, is that what it's going to be as far as for Razorback fans, where if they look at this game and if Baylor gets off and can't really get a lot of threes going, is that kind of the only thing that they have going for them to win a game like this? Oh, you ready for this one, John? This yeah. one's my favorite one. It's my favorite little trick. 362nd in America in low post scoring frequency. Ooh. They will not feed the paint. They will not throw the ball down low and post you up. So no worries about Flo Thamba or Josh Ojanwuna taking the ball, making a big man move and putting it in the root. I'll be there second to last in college basketball in that. So when you say live and die, but it, it's true. They, they act, they're going to shoot the ball from the outside, uh, but they're great at shot creation. Keontae George can shoot the ball well. Adam Flagler and LJ Cryer are two of the best in the Big 12. Cryer had five threes in the first half alone against Kansas, so they're not afraid to pull the trigger, and there's not really an offense. It's set a screen, try to get a guard somewhere open on the perimeter, or even Jalen Bridges, who's kind of your stretch four, and, and jack it up. Jack it up, hope it goes in. And it goes in a lot more at home, too. These road games are ugly. The defense is much more. I mean, that's the nature of college basketball. But in, in the Farrell Center, these guys, where they've shot a gajillion shots, they just seem to find a way, contested or not, to knock down enough to win these games. And when they don't knock it down, they've trained Flo Thamba and Josh Ojanwuna, the two big guys, to go get the basketball. Here's a long rebound. Be ready for long rebounds. So I would hope that Eric Musselman, his Arkansas staff, has been working all week at how to rebound the long ball because there are going to be a whole lot of them when Baylor misses a whole lot of threes compared to still making a whole lot of threes. I guess I noticed that Baylor's a high-scoring team, and you know they're averaging was close to 80 points a game. Almost, and, yeah. And, yeah. So is it more like... Is it because of how efficient they are offensively, or is it more just the pacing? Because you know mm. we see teams that are high scoring that may you know put up a lot more shots than other teams do, and then they give up a lot of points on the other end. So is it just the pacing that they have as far as that's why they're high scoring? Or is it just because of their efficiency and uh, being able to have a high percentage and make good shots? I, I love, John, that this game's happening on the cusp of that Kansas game because it's going to prove every point correct that Baylor fans have been thinking. Uh, and it's this team's a volume shooting team. It's absolutely the pacing. It's it's not the actual making of the shots. It is just the shooting the ball. They shot 36% from the field against Kansas. KU shot 47%. It was a game that Baylor was up double digits. I think 19 was their largest lead, 16, 19, somewhere in there. Uh, just because every time they catch the basketball, they're they're probably going to shoot it. They're going to jack one up. 
And if it goes in just enough, they're going to win the game. And if it doesn't go in, they're likely getting an offensive board. They had 17 of those against KU, which was what buried the Jayhawks. So you're, you're not going to see this Jay Wright impeccable offense where Arkansas fans are blown away at the fundamentals of the Baylor offense. Instead, you're going to see Adam Flagler has the ball. Adam Flagler shoots a three. Whether it goes in or doesn't, they don't really care. They're just happy to be shooting the ball. So what scares you the most about Arkansas then, if you're a Baylor fan? Like, what's the thing that may be a weakness that can be exposed that could be problematic that Arkansas can actually take advantage of? Uh, give me – so there's there's a difference to me. And you – correct me if I'm wrong here. There is – injuries have played into this. Maui, Arkansas, and – opening five, six games of SEC Arkansas. If if you give me Maui, Arkansas, I am I just blown away by the athleticism, the speed of play, the moxie to the way this team just plays with that extra youthful edge. If Baylor brings that into the Farrell Center, it, they're going to be problems. It'll be serious problems. The Baylor team that likes to, despite lo loving to shoot the ball, playing an aggressive brand of basketball, they're still, they're not the whole, the, the whole like moxie trash talk. If Arkansas can assert some dominance early, scare these guys, put them on their heels. That's what frustrates me the most. I know it's kind of a cop out because there's not, that's not anything schematically or from the floor, but I legitimately think there are teams that step on the floor with Baylor, assert their dominance from the jump. And that sets a tone for the rest of the game. If Arkansas does that, they've got more than a fighter's chance in Waco. And it sounds like they're going to be, we can get into this enough Arkansas fans in the building to at least bring that bench to life. I'm thinking so. I, I feel like there's probably a lot of fans still in the Dallas area. You probably know a lot about that too. And just in the DFW area that, you know, because how far is Waco from Dallas? Like hour, hour and a half, yeah, hour like and that. a half, maybe depends on how fast you drive. Arkansas fans like an hour. Okay. Yeah. So that yeah, that's, that's nothing for them. So I'll, I'll be curious to see how many are, are there. Cause again, I think that the Baylor fans are probably going to show out there too. But Arkansas has not really had many times where they've been able to show their dominance. You know, mm -hmm. like they then just kind of set the tone. They did against, actually did it against LSU in their previous game. Yeah. The very first half, they did that. But besides that, it just, they're kind of waiting on it too. So it might just come down to, all right, which is going to be the, the, the dominant team, like the physical presence who sets the tone early. That's kind of how I view this game too, is I, I feel like whatever the start is, Whoever is, you know, whether it's it's Baylor starts hitting a bunch of threes in the beginning or if Arkansas is able to get a bunch of stops early, you know, that could end up being the dictating uh, part of this game, too. Yeah, it's the same two coaches from that Elite Eight game. It's the same two general styles of well, Baylor got up in that game, the Elite Eight game, and Arkansas would claw back, get within four, get within six, and then Baylor would hit a three. Or Arkansas mm -hmm. would claw back again, and then Baylor would hit a three. Feels like another one of those games. Which team gets up by 10 or 12 early, is able to control the game to where, hey, look, you can you can come back a little bit. We're never going to give you the safety of a lead or, or getting all the way back in. And, and I see this game being a lot closer than many of your your experts, your analytics, your your algorithms will say, just because there are similarities in the youth of these two teams that really make it to where anything can happen. You, you already mentioned if Arkansas plays their full potential and Baylor just has an okay night. It could be a 10-point Arkansas win in the Farrell Center. And one of the big storylines to me, you got Anthony Black, who is awesome to watch play. And Keontae George, who, despite Baylor winning the last five games, has had a couple of off nights in his last two games. And now you get to see two of the premier freshmen in the country go toe to toe. What do you expect out of that matchup? Yeah, Anthony Black has been so good for Arkansas. And it's not even just really in his point totals. Like he has, he is capable. You mentioned Maui. Like he was out there, he went for 25 points against Creighton. Like he is incredible where he really can get going. But the thing about Anthony Black is that he's just good at everything else. Like he's six foot seven and he's a point guard. Like yeah. that, that's a rarity where you see that type of deal. He's going to do mainly the ball handling. He's great at defense because he loves playing defense. That's why Musk really wanted him on the team is because he's just so good defensively because he has a passion for it. He can rebound. He can pass. He can shoot on occasion. It's not great, but he can. He can get to the free throw line. Uh, he can get steals. So he's just kind of a, a jack of all trades. And he's had so many games this year where if you just look at his points, you're like, oh, he has 10 points, big whoop. Well, he has 10 points, eight rebounds, six assists, mm. four you know, steals, and then two block shots. It's like a very over-the-top deal. So that's that's what I'm going to be interested in to see is not only 
how Anthony Black handles all those things and sees he has another game like this. But uh, also going up against George, who is having a great year offensively too. Uh, you know, 17 points a game is nothing to sneeze at. So can Anthony Black's defense and his length cause some problems for Keontae George and get him out of a rhythm there? Uh, I think that'll be the case. But here's the thing too. Muss, as we all know, he doesn't just go of, oh, okay, my point guard's going to guard their point guard. Or yeah. it's, it's like, I'm going to take, he always gets his best defensive player and says, go guard their best offensive player. So who knows? Maybe we don't get to see much of uh, Black and George up against each other because Devo has done a good job. But uh, I think that that's going to be the thing that you have to look for in the box scores. Just what does Black do across the board? And if he stays out of foul trouble because he's had issues with that too. Yeah. Aggressive player. Uh, not in a way that that I find mm, – in a way that I find – as a young sports fan, I like the way Anthony Black plays basketball. Um, and again, I think Moxie's the right word for what he brings to the floor and what a lot of the Arkansas guys bring to the floor that Baylor lacks. Uh, and it, it just depends on your, your flavor there. Arkansas has picked theirs. And uh, this team in general, it, it's confusing me a little bit because I've already talked about how – SEC play, they start slow, and then boom, you go on your big, long run. D does this team, do they have the pieces in them to do that? Or, or does it feel like they still are a Nick Smith Jr. away from hitting that level? Or can they even do it without him? I think right now, with the roster they have, they're an NCAA tournament team. But mm. that could be like an 8-9 seed. They're, they're not a team that is terrible or bad, but they're not a team that, is built to make a run or to yeah. have that uh, type of same success they had the past couple years. But adding Nick Smith, because the game of basketball, one player can truly make all the difference in the world. Are they going to be a national championship team? No, I, I still think there's because there's so many things that have to go right for that. But are they another lead eight team? Absolutely, because Nick Smith is that dude. He is that good to where yeah. in inserting him into the lineup immediately, not only do you worry about think about his stats and his numbers and what he starts scoring. But when other teams face Arkansas, they're like, this is, we have to guard this guy. We have to, this is our priority and opens up other guys too. So just the presence of Nick Smith makes a huge difference. And I think that if he comes back, which he is coming back and Nick Smith's going to be coming back in February, if he comes back healthy and ready to go, it elevates Arkansas from being just a borderline NCAA tournament team to a possible sweet 16 elite eight team once again. John, the aura around this game, uh, you know, Southwest Conference. So there's the 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 older crowd's going to be ready for, you know, this rivalry revived. You and I aren't, you know, we we weren't uh, blessed enough by the Southwest Conference. What's what's the feel really? Because, you know, Arkansas is so great. You get a full pulse across the state in games like this, whereas in Texas, there's 15 D1 schools. What's the feel around this one amongst Arkansas fans, even those making the trip? Honestly, I don't feel like it's anything uh, special, as, as bad as it is to say. And it's not anything like an insult to Baylor or anything. It's just, I mean, yeah, there's a lot of history as far as the Southwest Conference goes, but there's nothing there to, to make Arkansas feel more something about this yeah. game. You know, like Texas, Texas A&M, Texas Tech, uh, you know, things like that, uh, maybe. But I think also adding into the mix that Arkansas and Baylor haven't really played each other a whole lot in, mm -hmm. in really any major sport. They played each other in the NCAA tournament few years ago as we know in basketball and baseball they played a 2012 there. yeah 2012 the world series uh super read or getting to the college world series which was a wild game so there's i think there's just because modernly at least there's just not any reason to hate baylor or to have any issues with baylor mm -hmm. or anything like that so there's energy because it's exciting because baylor's a good team and everybody knows that but as far as comparing it to maybe some other teams that they face from the old southwest classic or southwest uh, southwest conference that it, it, there's not a whole lot of juice. I don't know what it's like for the Baylor side of things, but it's that's kind of how it is for Arkansas. I think when you're Baylor, this is the SEC has built the empire in college athletics. So when you're a Baylor fan and an SEC team comes to your place, and if it was Vanderbilt, you wouldn't care very much, but the proximity, the geographic proximity, and knowing that Arkansas has had some good teams, they played each other in basketball recently, you're going to get one of the better crowds you'll see out of Waco this year. It's officially a sellout, too. Um, it's not speaking from the Arkansas side, if if it's Arkansas, Kansas, you're going to Allen Fieldhouse. Everybody's talking about that. You know, nobody, I, I can guarantee you, nobody in Arkansas is thinking, man, I can't wait to get the Farrell Center. That's going to be awesome. Uh, and that's a great reason they're tearing it down and building a new one currently. So 
Baylor fans are ready for an SEC team for a new taste for, all right, let's get out of the, the mix, the big 12 for a little bit and get something new. Um, and Waco, Waco Owens are ready to host too. It's, you've got a lot of little hidden spots. Your George's bar and grill down here that love bringing in opposing fans. It's one of the only bars and grills in town. Um, and yeah, I saw somebody had tweeted that you don't drink the water and they're, they're pretty much on par with that. Please don't drink the water. Uh, but campus itself is beautiful and all the chip and Joanna stuff, man, has become such like a Mecca for people to travel all across the world to. So this, uh, it's always neat to bring in a fan base that doesn't usually come to Waco. And I think there's, there's that element to that for Baylor fans. Yeah, I think so too. Like, I, I mean, I'm interested in going just cause I've never been and, yeah. you know, just to kind of see some of the spots that are going on, but, what, uh, but real quick, why can't you drink the water or what's, what's wrong with the water there? So, all right. Um, it is. It's better now. Let's throw that. Let's throw that out there. So, Stephenville, Texas, our yeah. Bryles, like you know, all those Jared Stidham. It is about a hundred miles north of us, maybe a little bit less. Cow farms, dairy farms, and it's right on the Brazos River or the Bosque River, and it runs just right through Waco and right into the lake that we drink from. So it's the same way where Conway, Conway's water, you know, like there's always that month of the year, don't drink Conway's water. Imagine yeah. that, but 12 months out of the year due to cow manure. It's better now. It used to be way worse than it is now, uh, but I still don't drink it. So just Got throwing it. that one out there to everybody that's coming down. You don't have to filter it again. It's, it's okay, um, but be weary of that for sure. All right, good heads up then, because uh, I mean, I'm sure a lot of Razorback fans aren't going to have to worry about you know drinking too much water. Uh, I think they're going to probably be drinking other things too instead. But yeah, I I wasn't even aware of uh, things like that, and I got a lot of great wrecks though as far as places go. You mentioned George's, yeah, yeah I've been a lot of cool places that uh, has been recommended. So I'm just excited to just experience something new, you know. And like I felt like Arkansas in the SEC Big Twelve Challenge was getting. Oklahoma State and TCU mm. all the time. Yeah. Or uh, Texas Tech even was thrown in there. But, you know, they never got Kansas, never got Texas, never got um, Kansas State even they didn't play. So it's kind of also cool because for how long this thing has been going on, the fact that this is the first time that both these teams have met, it's kind of ridiculous. But I think people are just excited to venture out and have something new, kind of similar to what Baylor is too. Yeah, without a doubt. I know that that hype exists here, and um, I, I, there, I'm sure there are a lot of Arkansas and Baylor fans both that think this is a Baylor win automatically. I don't know if it's where I was born, and I'm because I'm supposed to say it, but I, I really do think that Arkansas has got a fighter's chance in this game. Uh, John, before we close out, give me three names, three guys that Baylor fans need to watch on, on Saturday when these three guys hit the court. Who are the ones that that PA guy is going to call out the names most often? Well, we already talked about Anthony Black. Can't miss him with his wild hair as you have in the picture there. I mean, he he's he's hard to miss, but he's going to play a lot in this game, and he is really one of the best players on the roster. In fact, he might be the best player on the roster right now when it comes to just his overall game. So look out for him because he's also someone who, I'm not saying he talks trash necessarily, but he likes to bait he likes to bait people so moxie john moxie yeah yeah go with moxie so just look out for that because he's probably going to do that he does it on every road trip he's probably going to do it against baylor so he might be uh, public enemy number one pretty quickly but watch for him also watch for devo davis he's the guy who's been in this program for three years now mm. and he started off terrible but now he's really turned it on especially offensively like he's hitting threes he's, he's making good shots good shot selections uh, I think that he's also one of the elite defenders in the conference. And as I mentioned, you know, Muss is always going to have his best defensive player play the best player on every team. And so Devo's probably going to be the guy that's guarding the best players on Baylor. So look out for him. And the other guy is kind of a, it's a hit or miss deal. So they may hear from him a lot or they may not hear anything from him. And that's Ricky Council. He is mm -hmm. a dude that is showing, especially at the beginning of the year, he could go for 20, 25 points. He was leading the SEC for a period of time in scoring, and he's just been struggling a lot lately. He gets frustrated. He gets in his own head, and he has a game where he only has four points, and then he'll have a game where he's got 28. So yeah. if he has – I'll just tell you this. If he has a big game, Baylor's losing because when he plays well, Arkansas wins. So if Baylor does a good job against him, it's probably uh, not going to bode very well for the Razorbacks. 
Yeah. For Hog fans, LJ Cryer, Adam Flagler, Keontae George, guys who've all been mentioned throughout the show, those three guys, uh, if, if, Arkansas, if Baylor scores 78 points, they'll score 70. So Flagler, Cryer, George, they're, they're the scoring uh, three-headed monster at guard that look a lot like Davion Mitchell, Jared Butler, and Macy Oteague, who live in, I'm sure, Eric Musselman's nightmares from a couple of years ago in that Elite Eight. But, John, that's it. Let's play basketball. Absolutely. Can't wait to go down there to Waco, and hopefully it ends up being – an entertaining game, to say the least, and hopefully uh, the people there, the fine folks of Waco, are very kind to the Razorback fans, and they'll have plenty of hall calls, and they'll probably get pretty annoyed by it very quickly. I can't wait for it. John, if folks like your stuff, are, these Baylor fans want to transfer into uh, Arkansas fan, and where can they find you? Yeah, you find me on social media, at Buzz John Neighbors. Very simple like that, and also the Locked on Razorbacks podcast each and every day. So we uh, we break it down, and it's the world's number one Razorback daily podcast. And, you know, I don't know how many other ones there are, but we're number one. So we're going to roll with it until we can't anymore. Bingo. I love it. For Drake Toll, John Neighbors, thank you for making Locked On Baylor, Locked On Razorbacks your first listen every single day. Can guarantee you if you come back on Monday, you'll get a great recap of whatever happens in this one. This has been a Locked On Baylor, Locked On Razorbacks crossover episode.